Two events are independent if the outcome of one event does not change the probability that the other event occurs. If two events are not independent, we say they are dependent. So if you flip a coin and a die, the outcome of the coin has no effect on what happens with the die. So whether or not the coin was a heads or a tails, the die does not care what the outcome of the coin was. It does not change the probability of rolling a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 on the die. So those events are independent. If you pick a card from a deck, replace it, then pick another card, the probability associated with each card has no effect on the probability associated with the other card. So if you were to choose one card, let's just say that card was the Ace of Hearts, if you replace it and then, and then randomly choose another card, you could choose the Ace of Hearts again. So there are 52 cards to choose from to start in the first pick. There are still 52 cards in the second pick, and the probability was not changed from one card to the next. Now, if you did not put the card back, then when you chose the second card, there's only 51 cards left. So if you chose the Ace of Hearts on the first card, the Ace of Hearts is no longer in the deck, so that would affect the outcomes and the probabilities associated with the second card. So those will be dependent if you did not replace the card. If you toss two die, the probabilities of each die are not affected by the other die. So when you roll the first die and then roll the second die, it does not matter what happened on the first one. The second event will still have the same probabilities. Okay, so I give you the sample space here, which for when you roll two die. So the first one, you could have rolled a one, and the second one, you could have rolled a one. The first one, you could have rolled a one. The second one, you could have rolled a two, and so on. Now notice there are 36 total possibilities. So there's six going down this way and six across this way for a total of 36 possibilities. So we have a multiplication rule for independent events. And you have to pay attention to the wording when, you, when you're looking at probabilities. The probability of A and B. So now that and, that word, is actually very important. You're going to multiply the probability of A times the probability of B. So in this example, Suppose you toss two fair six-sided die. The probability of rolling a three first and a five second. Well, we can see in our sample space of all the 36 possibilities, a three first and a five second is this outcome right here, three first and five second. Notice that's only one outcome out of the 36 total. So we know the answer to this by looking at the sample space should be one out of 36. There's only one way to get a three first and a five second. If we apply the multiplication rule for independent events, because we know that the second die did not care what happened on the first one, so the events are independent, we can apply that multiplication rule. So rolling a three on the first die is one out of six. A five on the second die is one out of six again. So if you multiply one sixth and one sixth, that gives you one out of 36. On part B, a similar case, one first and a one second. Looking at the sample space, we see one first and, and a one second. There's one possibility out of the 36. And similar reasoning, for the multiplication rule, rolling a one on the first is one sixth. A one on the second is also one sixth for a probability of one out of 36. Okay, and then in part C, now we're gonna roll an even first and an odd second. So rolling an even number first, well, half of the numbers are even or three out of six, and, so we're going to multiply, an odd on the second one is also 3 out of 6. 
multiply straight across. 3 times 3 is 9. 6 times 6 is 36. That's how you multiply fractions. So you get 9 out of 36. Now that does reduce to 1 fourth. Now notice you could have also just said that 3 out of 6 is 1 half times another 1 half will give you 1 fourth right away. If you look at the sample space, an even first and an odd second, if you look at the even first, that could have been getting a 2 first, a 4 first, or a 6 first. Well, just getting an even first, notice that's half the, half the possibilities because this entire row is rolling a 2 first, this entire row is rolling a 4 first, and then this one is 6 first. But we also have to get an odd on the second. So the ones with an odd on the second row would be this one. I'm rolling a 2, then a 3, a 2, then a 5. Or you could have rolled a 4 and a 1, 4 and a 3, and a 4 and a 5. So those three. And then these three, 6 and a 1, 6 and a 3, 6 and a 5. So notice that is 3, 6, 9 out of the 36. Okay, which gave you this fraction right here. Okay, and then an even first and a 3 second. So an even on the first, well that probability is 3 out of 6 again. And so we're going to multiply a 3 on the second. Well, a 3 on a second, there's 1 3 out of 6 possibilities. So 3 out of 6 times 1 out of 6 is 3 out of 36, or 1 12th. Okay, so getting an even on the first and 3 on the second, well, it has to be, getting a 3 on the second has to be one of these in this column here, getting a 3 on the second. So which of those have an even first? Well, the 2, 4, and 6 are even on the first and three on the second. So there are one, two, three of them out of 36. Notice the one and the three, three and the three, and five and three would not have counted in order to get an even first and three second. Okay, so that's using the multiplication rule for independent events. The only other thing I want to point out is you have to really be careful with the wording and notice I specifically said 3 on the first and 5 second. So they have to happen in that order. If you just said the probability of rolling a 3 and a 5, you have to look at it as you could have gotten a 3 first and a 5 second, or you could have gotten a 5 first and a 3 second. So the probability of rolling a 3 and a 5 in either order and this is where you got to be very careful and, and understand how the question is being asked and what it wants. Rolling a 3 and a 5 in either order, you could have, you could have gotten a 3 and a 5, which is right here. So there's one case. Or you could have gotten the 5 and the 3. So notice that there are two possibilities out of the 36, which would just be adding 136 plus one, 1 out of 36. So basically you would, you would do this twice because either order implies you could have gotten the 5 first and the 3 second. So you just have to be careful with the wording on that. When I word things, I will generally specify what happened first and what happened second just to avoid that confusion. Okay, on the next example I give you, it's a little more complicated. So the probability that a person in the US is left-handed is about 17%. So when you, when you choose one person out of the population, the probability they're left-handed is about 17% or 0.17. Three Americans are selected. Okay, so now you're gonna randomly choose three people. Find the probability that the first person is left-handed. Well, the way you want to look at this, you're choosing three people. Okay, so I, I kind of just write placeholders, first person, second person, third person. 
So if the first person is left-handed, what had to happen on the first person? When you chose them, they had to be left-handed. So the probability that first person is left-handed is 0.17. Okay, so 17%, which is 0.17 as a decimal. Okay, so that first person had to be left-handed. Now again, you have to pay attention to wording. The probability the first person is left-handed. Notice they said nothing about the second two people. But you're still choosing three total. So no matter what here, you're choosing three people, but it didn't matter what those last two people were. So those last two people, they could have been left-handed or right-handed. So you can look at that as just saying you have a 100% chance of choosing the second two people. And I know that seems a little weird, okay, but with the wording of this question, if the first person is left-handed, it didn't say anything about the second two. Okay, the other thing I want to point out before we go on is that when you choose three people, even though we're not putting the person back before we choose the second person, we can treat them as independent events. And the reason is we have a very large population that we're choosing from. So we can treat events as independent. Now, technically, they're not. Because when you choose one person, if you don't put them back, it, it does change the probability of what happens on the next person than the next person. But because there's, uh, there's approximately three, over 300 million people in the U.S., so when you choose one person and don't put them back, the probability does not change um, significantly. It, now, it does change, but just not significantly enough for our purposes. So, so, the, so a concept here is if you have a large population, then you can treat events as independent, even though technically they're not. Okay, if you don't quite understand this first one with the times one times one, uh, times one there, hopefully the second one will clear it up for you. Find the probability that only the first person is left-handed. So we're going to choose three Americans. So we have three people. One, two, three. The probability that only the first person is left-handed. So what has to happen if only the first person is left-handed? You have to choose a left-handed person on the first one. If only the first person is left-handed, can the second one be left-handed? No. They must be what? Right-handed. Third person also must be right-handed. So this is the only sequence you can get where only the first person is left-handed. In the first example, we didn't care what the second two people were. We just wanted to make sure the first person was left-handed. But now what we're saying is you have to choose a left-handed person first and then a right-handed person second and third. So we have 0.17 for the left-handed person, and then the complement of 0.17 will give you 0.83. So that's just 1 minus 0.17. Okay, so if you go through and try the next several for the sake of time, do the same thing as I did here. You read the question, and you think about how can I get what I want. So the probability of the first two are left-handed. You have to think about what has to happen when you choose the three people for the first two to be left-handed. Okay, so if you take a minute and try that, and I'll put the answers up for the sake of time. Okay, so the first two left-handed, you have to get left and left. And then the third one didn't matter. They didn't say anything about the third one. Because they didn't say only the first two are left-handed. So that third person, it didn't matter what they were. Part D, all three are left-handed. And then the last one, or the next one, none are left-handed. 
Well, if none are left-handed, they all have to be right-handed. And pause the video if I'm going too fast. Okay, so I want to keep it shorter. The last one, par F, this one is a little trickier. This one you really have to pay attention to. The probability that at least one is left-handed. Well, to get at least one left-handed, you think about how can that happen? Well, it could be that the first person was left-handed and then the last two or the second two are right-handed. Or you could have gotten a right-hand person first, then a left, then a right. Or you could have gotten a right, right, then a left. And again, we're looking at how can you get at least one left-handed? Well, at least one could be one or two or three left-handed. So there's a lot of different possibilities there. And these are all the different ways that you could have gotten at least one left-handed. So those first three is getting one left-handed. And then the next three are getting two left-handed. So LLR, LRL, and so on. And then the very last one, you could have gotten all left-handed. So each of those cases represents at least one left-handed. So what you can do, you could go through each of these probabilities and find them. So LRR, that'd be 0.17 times 0.83 times 0.83. RLR would be 0 0.83, 0 0.17 times 0.83. You could find each of those probabilities and then add them together because you could have gotten this sequence or this sequence or this sequence or this sequence and so on. Now that's a lot of work. What well, we can do this another way would be using the complement. Well, the complement of at least one, notice the only thing missing here when we choose three people, one, two, or three, the only thing missing is zero people. So choosing zero left-handed is the complement of choosing at least one left-handed. So we can use the complement rule. The complement of at least one is zero. So if x is the number of left-handed people, what we're looking for is x to be one, two, or three. Okay, so one or two or three left-handed. The complement of that, the only thing missing, is zero. So we can use the probability of zero left-handed, which means they're all right-handed, right and right and right. Multiply those together, you get 0.5718. Now that's the probability of zero left-handed. We're looking for at least one. So we have to use that complement rule where we subtract that probability from one and we end up with 0 0.4282. So if you would have added each of these sequences probabilities together, or the probability of each of these sequences together, you would get 0 0.4282. Okay, so that one is a, is a lot trickier. At least one is, is very tricky.